Uh, and now I'm pleased to introduce the first of our two closing keynote sessions, a conversation about the 2016 <coughs> presidential campaign, which is already well underway. There's a bit of history here. To close out the 2012 festival, we convened a panel of big brand journalists looking ahead to that year's presidential election, only six weeks out at that point, not a year plus in advance. But the questions on our minds then were the same as they are this time. Is the campaign different from any other? And if so, how? Who are these candidates really? Which issues have risen to the surface and are driving voters to vote? And of course, who's going to win? That panel featured Rick Hertzberg of The New Yorker, Gwen Eiffel of PBS's NewsHour, and our old Texas running buddy, Julie Mason of Sirius XM Radio. The fourth participant was supposed to be Maggie Haberman of Politico, who took ill at the last minute. <laughs> I, I promised her we'd have her back, that we do something like this again. Really, we needed to use her plane ticket before the credit exactly. expired. <laughs> In any case, I'm a man of my word. Um, I'm so happy we're doing this again, especially since we could have two Texans running for the White House in 2016, and another two who spent significant time here growing up. This is very much our story. Our presidential campaign panel uh, preview panel this year features the great Maggie, plus four other respected and acclaimed journalists, chatty and provocative by disposition, and we're lucky to have them in Austin. Let me say a few words about each. Maggie Haberman, senior political reporter at Politico, where she put down roots after spending most of her career at the New York Post began covering City Hall for the Post in 1999 at age 24, and except for a short trip across the street to the New York Daily News, remained there through 2010, covering a variety of city, state, and federal races, including the 2008 presidential race. Chris Hayes is host of All In with Chris Hayes, which airs weeknights on MSNBC. He's also editor-at-large at The Nation, where he's previously served as Washington Bureau Chief and has written for the New York Times Magazine, Time, The New Republic, and other publications. His first book, Twilight of the Elites, America After Meritocracy, was published in 2012. Nia Malika Henderson is a national political reporter for the Washington Post. As of just this last week, I believe, writes for the paper's blog, The Fix, about the intersection of politics, culture, and demography. Before the Post, she covered the White House for Politico. Jonathan Martin is national political correspondent for the New York Times. He, too, worked at Politico previously as senior political writer from its inception in 2007 until 2013. He's the co-author of the New York Times bestseller, The End of the Line, Romney versus Obama, The 34 Days That Decided the Election. Finally, Dave Weigel, who spent the last four years as a political reporter for Slate, and next month begins a job reporting for the soon-to-launch Bloomberg Politics Vertical. Previously, he wrote for the Washington Post and Reason magazine. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. So pretend we didn't talk about this in advance and be surprised by the, <laughs> the, the brilliance that I'm going yes. to lay, lay before you right now. I want to begin with a premise. The premise is that every presidential election is ostensibly about the next four or eight years, but it is invariably, at least to some degree, about the last four or eight years. If that premise is true, I want to talk about President Obama, because this election will be conducted against the backdrop of the Obama administration in the way that the 2008 race was conducted against the backdrop of the Bush administration. Uh, Nia, what do you think about Obama as a factor in this race? How much will he be a factor in this race? Well, I mean, we can see now, obviously, in 2014, he's a huge factor. Uh, his approval ratings are very low across the board. Uh, but I do think one of the real takeaways that we're going to see from sort of the Obama effect uh, is the registration of all these voters, particularly in the South. Uh, and a lot of these candidates uh, in 2016 are going to look to uh, the South, certainly in terms of the Democratic Party and trying to expand uh, the pie of voters they've been able to get uh, in these previous elections. So that's one thing. I also think we don't know what the story of the Obama uh, administration will be. It's We've not got, done. We, it's not done. We've right. got two years. Uh, he'll be uh, either saddled with a, a, you know, two houses controlled by Republicans or a gridlock for the next two years. We don't know what he's going to do on immigration reform, if he's going to be able to smooth some of the edges there that he yep. has uh, on that issue. We don't know how prominent foreign policy will be. We weren't talking about ISIL uh, six months ago, uh, a year ago. We don't know a year from now, two years from now, where that's going to be in terms of prominence. Right. Foreign policy. Chris, we don't know whoever the Democratic nominee is, he or she, uh, in the next election. We don't know whether President Obama will be a help or a hindrance. We can pretty much assume that whoever the Republican nominee is, he will run against President Obama, right? 
Yeah, although I, I think if I had to predict about the role that Barack Obama will play in 2016, and again, there's a lot that could happen. Um, and I think Mia's right. I think the most important legacy will be a kind of structural one about how you win a Democratic presidential campaign yep. from, a, from a ground level. Um, I think Barack Obama will probably play the role in 2016 that Obamacare is playing in 2014, which is, like, <laughs> you know, that was the number one issue in America for a very long time. It right. was incredibly successful in generating anger in the Republican base particularly and motivating people. And now it is converted into this bizarre issue that is neither is it doesn't seem to be a, a huge help for either party and is increasingly just not discussed. It is not the it is not the number one issue. Yeah. And I think in a weird way that will essentially be the role of Barack Obama. I don't think you will see a George W. Bush type situation in which he like beams into the convention. Uh, to, remember that? That was a bizarre <laughs> yeah. moment. Yeah. I mean, he's the sitting yeah. president yeah. of the yeah. United yeah. States. Yeah. Well, yeah. What, yeah. what I really remember was McCain going to the White House finally for the laying on of hands. The hot dog and, lunch. And, and he, yeah. there was a, sh a handshake <laughs> with Bush where McCain was so far away from yeah. Bush yeah. that yeah. you could right. practically not get them in the same so, frame. Yeah, I don't, I, don't think you will, I don't think you will see that, but I also don't think it will be the case um, that he will be a, be a massive help. I think in, in specific places, yeah. he will obviously be a huge help. Yeah. Um, uh, and with specific populations, but but that, yeah, that's how it's. Yeah. I think Secretary Clinton's challenge will be having to <laughs> to <laughs> reconcile. You're, ju you're just jumping <laughs> yeah. ahead, right? That's it. Sure. Yeah. Um, having to recognize that to the points that Nia and Chris made, um, President Obama did change the Democratic coalition and how Democrats win the presidency. And her challenge will be how to at once balance the Obama coalition of voters. Yes. Uh, and not ticking them off by distancing yourself from President Obama, but at the same time trying to wink and nod at a more skeptical electorate that she's not necessarily President Obama. And what comes to mind, Evan, yeah. is George H.W. Bush in 1988, who effectively ran for a Reagan third term, but who, make no mistake, said kinder, gentler. And everybody knew what it was kinder yeah. and gentler from what? Oh. From Reagan. I think this will be a more pronounced version of that, where you have Secretary Clinton, you know, in ways that are not over the top, but are certainly clear, showing how she is her own person and not President Obama. This is a really interesting point because the fact is, Al Gore had a problem in, right. in 2000. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm the change, yes. but I'm also part of the last administration. It's a very difficult yeah. balance. The product differentiation that I think you'll see from from Secretary Clinton, and I, I'm with Jonathan that I assume she is very likely to be the nominee. I realize I'm now jumping way ahead, right. um, <laughs> but uh, we can go back to that. Yeah. But you're you're already seeing what she's doing, and, and Jonathan's absolutely right that she has she runs a risk of offending Obama supporters, uh, depending on how she handles if she separating from herself him. too much. That's right. right. And so the, the time when you really saw in this past year her do some sort of separation was on foreign policy, not on domestic policy. She's spoken very little about domestic policy so far. Yeah. She talked about uh, in terms of arming the rebels in Syria a couple of years ago and how they had disagreed on that. And she uh, essentially said that his organizing principle, don't do stupid stuff, is not an organizing principle uh, for foreign policy. Uh, right. That criticism got walked back, basically, two days later. She didn't take back the words, but she essentially did a, a public sort of, I, I meant no harm. Uh, and so she's going to continue doing that. What she's talking about in almost every appearance, almost every, not every, is her husband. She is speaking very clearly about his record. Under yeah. my husband, uh, there was a rising tide that did lift yeah, all boats. There was the a much Clinton better term. economy. Yeah. It's the third well, term. well, and she had a problem with this in 2008 of being perceived as running for the third Clinton term. After the recession, there is some belief right. uh, among Democrats <coughs> that she will be in, a, in, in better shape to run for the third Clinton term after what we've seen economically in this country right. um, than she would with Obama. But the other thing I would say in terms of Obama specifically as a factor, he will be a factor to some extent because you're already seeing Ted Cruz on this stage yesterday describe the Obama-Clinton foreign policy repeatedly. <laughs> you're going to hear that phrase a lot. Right. A lot of this is going to come down to what the perception is about the economy. And so if, the, if people believe in their lives that the economy is doing better, then that is where Obama will be a positive factor. If they don't, well, then he you won't know, be. But Dave, the last election was supposed to be about the economy. Three words, Governor Rick Perry, right? <laughs> we, we heard that Governor Perry was going to be successful as the nominee and successful in the national election, in part because he had this great economic record to run on, and that whole election was going to be litigated on the economy. It didn't work out that the election was about the economy. It became about something else. 
But I'm thinking about Obama's effect on the Republican Party over six years. The Republican Party that exists right now, is it, it's recognizable, but the voices in it that have taken leadership roles and taken issue-defining, policy-defining roles, got that because to, to, be a, to, to, to oppose Obama was to be a Republican uh, in especially 2009, 2010, 2011. On this stage, we saw Ted Cruz do something. I think he's done this before, but we talk about Syria in the context of a humble foreign policy. The Republican Party used to run on a humble foreign policy. That's not what John McCain ran on. Ran on. It's not even what Mitt Romney ran on. I mean, a lot of the Mitt Romney nostalgia that you see from some, from mostly from people who used to work for his campaign that still talk to journalists, <laughs> yeah. was that he called out and Russia. got big checks from right. that campaign. Donors too. Right, exactly. <laughs> and donors too. Yes. Some donors. Um, that's the, the libertarian wing of the Republican Party just flourished in ways that were completely unpredictable in 2007 when, when Ron Paul was a joke candidate. And I think one of the, the Obama legacies is going to be a couple of people in this primary, Rand Paul, possibly Cruz, other people who are going to run not as, I guess, le, for, for a less hubristic foreign yeah. policy vision, which is not Could, what the Republican Party stood for yeah, before. And this, this, to me, actually, on the, the foreign policy dynamic, it, particularly within the Republican Party, I think is is the most interesting dynamic to me, yeah. um, for a few reasons. One, I think there's a genuine, a real gulf between the base and the donor class. I think the donor class is far, far more hawkish. Um, I mean, there's a Sheldon Adelson primary. I mean, there. I mean, you know, particularly in the in the age of of Post Citizens United, yep. you know, that guy can give you five hundred million dollars. Right. That, that, really, he yeah. could. He could give you five hundred million dollars, and yeah. like. Sheldon Nelson's got pretty clear views. I mean, they all went to kiss the ring in Vegas. Um, yeah, yeah. So there's, there's this distinction, I think, between the donor class and the base. And then on top of that, all of the stuff we've been seeing develop on foreign policy in the kind of Paul tradition and, and the fact that Ted Cruz got up and joined him on the drone filibuster, mm -hmm. right. right? Well, two Americans just got murdered on television um, in, in, in the most brutal fashion in a way that is being played on a loop on cable news pressing this button in people right. about threat and fear. And the question now is, does that impulse survive this, mm -hmm. this sort of thing? And what happens thing. in the next two years to change the salience yeah. of, right. of that? And that's likely yeah. to affect the outcome. This has yeah. always yeah. One, been, one, been one, my question when it comes to the Republican tilt to libertarians on foreign policy. Does it survive events? Right. right. And my yeah, assumption right. was always that, that that event would be some kind of a uh, attack on U.S. interests somewhere right. here abroad. I didn't necessarily think it would be two beheadings on TV, but that's been the first event. Here's the reaction. Our poll last week, Republicans said, uh, would you support putting troops on the ground in Syria? 62% so said yes. Right. Said yes. yes. That's the reaction in that party to two beheadings. And so, the, and so right. to, Dave's, to Dave's point, that may change the calculation. Absolutely. Uh, let's do Maggie and then. Yeah, no, no. I just want to. I just want to go back to another point. Something yeah. that you said, which is that we were told the 2012 election was going to be about the economy, and it wasn't. It absolutely was about the economy. And I'll give you the two the two deciders on that. Although it was a very personality driven election, right. I think that in a way that uh, the Jonathan actually did a great story. What was it? The uh, Obama plan kill Mitt uh, very early on. I mean, that really is what they did. They the Obama team drove a very, very uh, personal caricature of him, but it was based on the economy, and it was based on two things. Obama, if you looked at the exit polls from that race, uh, overwhelmingly did better on the question of, does he understand people like me? Can right. he relate yeah. to people like me? Romney emerged as this sort of, you know, mustache handling, you know, cane wielding monopoly figure. Right. And Mon yeah, exactly. Right. That's right. And what, culturally it was out of touch. And, yes. and what Chris was just talking about the idea of the Adelson primary, Republic yeah. uh, Democrats are using that this year explicitly to brand Republicans as the party that are that are controlled like this by, by rich money. donors. That's right, exactly. By the Cokes. If you talk to Move On or you talk to the Democratic groups that do a lot of voter they're gonna do a lot of voter targeting in the last few weeks, you know, mailing people That's messaging, right. telling vote. It is not even individual Republicans. I mean, it's the message is that Republicans want to take away all of women's health care, et cetera, and re Repu Republicans want to roll back the clock on this and this. But yeah. it's that this is the party of David Koch, who we've made exactly. infamous, and Sheldon Adelson, who we've made infamous. And so you might not, it might not even be about 
the, there might be a better Republican candidate who doesn't fit that mold, they're going to brand him yeah, as the rich. It's as the, the rich concept yeah. of a rigged yeah. system. Yeah. That's the idea. I also think, I mean, if you know, we sort of talk about the way uh, Hillary Clinton has to deal with the Obama legacy. I think one of the ways that a couple of these Republican candidates are also going to uh, have to deal with the Obama legacy is that Obama was a guy who had the right idea when he ran about foreign policy. He gave right. really great speeches, but practically, I think some people might have questions about how he's governed uh, foreign policy. And I think you're going to have Republicans who've been in the Senate for a couple of years. Yeah. They're going to essentially be running on ideas, not necessarily the sort of practical experience yeah. uh, in running something. And, and, and this unites both foreign policy and domestic policy, but I think it's particularly germane on the economy because I think what Maggie said about the rig system is, is the overwhelming feeling of the, the electorate. Yeah. And here's why the, the 2012 and Governor Perry is a problem, um, is that you can only run on a better economy if people think that's possible. That's right. Mm -hmm. that's right? right. It's like that's if exactly a candidate right. comes to your door and says, I got a plan, we're gonna get rid of winter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, sure, well that would sound great. Sign I would up. love yeah. to get yeah. rid of winter. Move to Austin. Yeah. But right, can exactly. you get rid of winter? <laughs> right, yeah, that's right. There you go. But can you get rid of winter? No, you, that's like, right. so, so promises about the economy, I think we have had stagnating wages yeah. for so long. Remember, yeah. the Clinton period that's was right. about a three year period that is anomalous in a 30 year trajectory. Yeah, cool. It has yeah. been so long right. since people saw that in a, an appreciable yeah. real sense for the bulk of, of wage earners in this country, yeah. that promises about it, I think, just ring hollow from everyone. Does the, the Nia first brought up the question of the outcome of this election. We may very well be looking at a Republican Congress without a veto-proof majority, a Democratic president who can't get anything through that Congress but can prevent anything that that Congress wants to do that he doesn't want to do, a fight over executive action, a fight over to the degree that there are any more uh, cabinet appointments or nominations and the way that that whole process plays out in Congress. But basically two years in which we can all go on holiday. Nothing happens. Does the outcome of this election, should that be the case, change this calculation from a 2016 standpoint, um, or are the cards basically dealt now? I think there is, a, there is a sense among Democrats, and again, by Democrats, we tend to generally mean people who are backing Hillary Clinton, because so far we have not seen a strong uh, coalescence around another candidate, but, but this would apply for anybody, that if, they're, if the Republicans take back the Senate uh, and then they retain control, that that actually creates a, a Good opposition to the narrative for the Democrats. Correct. The dog caught the car. Precisely. Let's see what they do with it. Precisely, mm -hmm. and right. and and that because of what you just said, the perception and probably the reality that there will be not a whole lot accomplished. That it gives a very tangible foe yeah. to run against, and that would make it easier if you are a Democrat, a Hillary Clinton, or whomever who is trying to separate from Obama and not basically be totally tied to that, yeah. it becomes, here's the bigger yeah, problem. Yeah, it, I mean, also makes it uh, more difficult if you're a Republican, if you're Ted Cruz or if you're Rand Paul and well, you're in, you know, in the Senate, you hear Hillary Clinton using this phrase, guardians of gridlock, right. yep. uh, to describe Republicans, probably makes it easier if you're a Republican governor, Chris Christie. Well, I think Scott Walker, like Rick Perry, Where, you say. Right, you say, yeah. look at these guys. They're the problem. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Nothing, yeah. Nothing's getting done. I, I can tell you how it's going to go in the first six months of, the, of, the, of a Republican Senate, I think. If they get 51, 52, it doesn't really matter. I mean, if they. If they have any control whatsoever. You heard John Cornyn yesterday talk about what they, what they, what a Republican Senate could do, and it was the very inspiring and, and very inspiring and, and base rallying message of repealing the medical device tax, and getting rid of iPad, right? <laughs> so you're going to have. <laughs> Don't forget the XM, uh, XIM and the XM bank. Yeah, We're going right. to deal with the XM bank next September. You're going to have Republicans uh, come April facing a, bu uh, a budget. There'll be Heritage Action and all, and Jim right. Demint and all the groups that fought last time. De demanding that budget be used to destroy Obamacare. Right. There will be, I think, maybe Mitch McConnell can steady them and, and avoid another another confrontation, but by the time you're actually getting into the Republicans jumping in and having their first debates, you'll probably have the Senate already looking completely dysfunctional. And I, I, I just, I don't doubt the 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 talents of John Cornyn, people like that. I The Republican base that won the Senate is going to say, Hey, remember a year ago, or a year ago from now, I mean, when we, the government shut down and you said this is going to stop the party's chances of winning anything, the worst case scenario for them in this election is that they win maybe five Senate seats, right? Just because of where the Senate elections are. Worst they're going, case. Worst case scenario. Right. They're, they're going to have a microphone and some credibility even in, in, to, to say, you said Ted Cruz was wrong. Ted Cruz was completely right. And you'll hear the, the, the donors, the aforementioned 
coaxed and Adelson saying, no, 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 that wasn't how it worked. But I think you're going to have a fight that makes the, the, the Senate look what, uh, as Maggie descri described, the ideal Democratic version of the Senate is they caught the car and they just crashed in every wall they could find. I think and, that's the way yeah, they're, they're going to And the they of this is going to primarily be older white men yeah. uh, as the country is becoming more and more diverse. And that's going to be sort of this image that plays out over so the So it's a visual as well years. as a narrative. Right. Mm -hmm. well, right. Which, which yes. brings me back to something about um, Secretary Clinton and President Obama that we were talking about at the start of this discussion, which was, uh, I recall well, in 08, you know, the, the Clinton argument against then Senator Obama was, this guy is a babe in the woods. He's not ready for the Republican attack machine. You know, we need a tough, proven candidate who's going to be able to take on these blows and, and can actually confront them. And she yeah. has uh, the sort of rhino skin to do that, right? Well, the country is so fed up now with, with gridlock. I wonder if the Clinton differentiation between her, her and now President Obama in 16 is not going to be that she's tougher than him. It's going to be more of a Bill Clinton style. Deal. Look, yes. I right. can work with yeah. that. Yes. Right. My husband, my yeah. he, and he right. still did welfare reform, balanced budgets, yeah. and all kinds of uh, pro-trade deals in the yes. 90s. So I wonder if her separation from Obama this time around is going to be different. Yeah, and you heard her. I mean, she gave a speech uh, to the DNC this uh, Friday, and she wrapped that whole idea of being able to bring the country together and work together uh, and compromise really uh, in a gendered way. She talked about Patty Murray uh, being able to broker a deal yep. in, in the uh, government shutdown. Mm -hmm. And there is uh, some sense that if you talk to people in focus groups, they tend to think women, I mean, it's sort of a stereotype uh, that women uh, can bring people together more in sort of a kumbaya right. fashion. So it'll yeah. be sort of an implicit argument right. uh, there that she makes. So the one, the one substantive thing, I mean, you talk about taking a holiday and, you know, um, I don't think any of us are going to take a holiday, but there, there's two big fights that I think will happen other than the budgetary fights, which are going to be sort of, I think, white noise, essentially. There's going to be the executive action on immigration. Yes. And that, yeah. I, I think people don't quite understand what a big deal that is. I we're, we're, think that's true. We are talking about possibly five million people. Now, that is a big deal in two directions. It's a big deal to those people. It's a big deal to their family members, yeah. and it's a big deal more broadly to Latino voters. It's going to be a huge deal to the Republican base, which is going yes. to lose its mind. Yes. And I actually weirdly, in, a, in I, I was, I think from a kind of somewhat cynical broadcaster perspective, was hoping they did it before the election, of course. because I thought there would it would be a fascinating, dramatic. I thought it was going to be a bear good trap, ratings, a bear yeah. trap. Good for business. Yeah, right? yeah, ratings, right. yeah. It was going to be a bear trap that that led to that led to a shutdown. Yeah. I, 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 and, and so that is going to be a huge deal. Keep in mind also the, the when you think about Barack Obama and his legacy at the structural level about building a coalition, what it would mean for him to be the person that delivered five million people from the shadow of uncertainty, fear, and doubt into the light of some kind of of, of sort of quasi legitimate and, and, status, yeah. what that would well, mean generationally. Well, and do you assume, just to be totally crass about this and to talk about pragmatic politics, do you assume that that executive action translates into the Latino vote finally being activated on behalf of the Democrats? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I think so. And yeah. I mean, if you talk to activists, uh, activists about this and folks who work in the Latino community, they, they say they saw that happen in the lead up to the 2012 election when he made the announcement yeah. around DACA. And the folks I talked to literally say that Obama has a chance to be the great emancipator yeah. if he right. does this exactly. So the reality is the Democrats are as bummed yeah. as you are because it would have been good for their business <laughs> had he done it before the election also. Wait, who is? Uh, the, uh, the, the Democrats would have probably liked him to make the executive action happen. Uh, no, no. 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 But I think they, no yeah. I think they misunderstood that. their own interests, though. You, I mean, you, I, you, I actually think it was the wrong strategic call. Explain? Because I think I understand completely. If, well, I, were Mark, it, yeah. if I were Mark Pryor, I would be calling the White House being like, Please don't play. Yeah. Buddy, buddy, <laughs> buddy, I'm hanging on here. It's yeah. Arkansas, dude. I totally understand that, yeah. okay? <laughs> but but, but I, I actually think that I think it actually would have given them an opportunity to distance themselves from the president. Mary Landrieu, Mark Pryor, they could have been like, mm -hmm. this is absolutely unacceptable. Right. I'll vote to repeal it, but yada, yada, yada. It would, have, it would have provoked, what it would have done is provoked the worst impulses in the Republican base. They, re they, would, have, they would have not been able to control the reaction to it. And the, the least mo popular moment for the Republican con Congress was the shutdown. So if you can get them to act like that in 40 days before an election. Yeah, the, pr yeah, the problem with that is that, I mean, what, what we've seen with what, ha what has happened with ISIS, um, with what the president is doing in terms of the airstrikes, has actually nationalized 
an election, the Democrats have been work, working very, very mm. hard this cycle yeah. to try to localize. To localize. Yeah. And so, That's a good and I think that that is going to become very, very clear yeah. in the next couple of, uh, the next two weeks of polling. And so, while I totally agree with you that it would have provoked that kind of a reaction, you are dealing with races nationally that are so close yeah. that it is very, very, when you were talking about an issue that can turn out one side, um, and Democrats have historically had a trouble turning out their own base, uh, and you and there are a lot of candidate specific races. I think it is very very questionable um, that it would have well, been yeah, likely, those, more likely. Yeah. I think it would. Well, have let me just quickly yeah. say, Colorado is actually the only state where, from a from a from a number standpoint right. of, of the Latino vote at play of swing yeah. states, from a numbers point, yeah. where, yeah. where, where, where your play big. sells as big. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's grow, the Latino yeah. you know community is growing in these southern states. I mean, it's it's growing the fastest, fastest in these right. so, so, southern states, but it's still no you know two five three. Let me move. I want to move to 2016 specifically and the Republicans and the Democrats because. It'll be fun to talk about these things in very speculative and irresponsible terms mm -hmm. because there's no, there's no Let's consequence do for doing so. I'm a cable news broadcaster. We don't yeah. do that. Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> I was no, going to no. say, what is this TV? You would, you would never <laughs> do that. Um, so the 2016 race, in very shorthand, seems to be the DC guys versus the not DC guys, right? So there's going to be a group of them from the Senate: Rand Paul, Marco yeah. Rubio, maybe. Uh, Ted Cruz, Paul, maybe Paul Ryan, maybe Rob Portman, right. and then you're going to have the people outside of D.C., Chris Christie, who as of today in Politico apparently is telling people, I'm all but in, right. and Bridgegate is behind me and, you know, you can't wait to do it. Jeb Bush, maybe. Jeb Bush, maybe, Rick Perry, Scott Walker, Bobby Jindal, some combination of outside versus right. inside. Is that going to be the overwhelming architecture, Jonathan, mm -hmm. of that field? Yeah, I think that that's one way to put it. It will be the D.C. guys and the governors. Um, I think you could also do it more ideologically. Uh, you could sort of classify it uh, in a rough sort of establishment friendly versus more insurgent. Who, who are the who are the, uh, the outer poles if that if it's an ideological race? Is it um, Cruz and Christie? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's somewhat muddy, but I think with those two, it's pretty clear that one's a sort of center right establishment candidate, sort of donor class candidate, and the other is much more of an insurgent grassroots candidate. Sure. Dave, Chris Christie said, according to this political report, that he was telling it was said that he was telling donors, this is an incredibly weak field. Mm -hmm. Which I assume he meant compared to the last field. Has, Which he, is met so Herman, <laughs> has he met Herman Cain? I mean, is it really, does this field, this field doesn't, seem, doesn't seem weak. This field seems to me, if the last field was double A baseball, this is the 27 yeah. Yankees. I mean, that's that classic, you know, bluster from Chris Christie. No, that, that's the way, that's what he would say, but the, it, the thinking in 2012 was that the field was weak because all of the star, the star players were just going to come to in run. in 2016. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Marco right. Rubio yeah. has been completely underrated because of the way immigration played out, right. which is strange to me because we've seen this before. We saw John McCain implode and destroy his chances of becoming a nominee because of an immigration vote that happened closer to that primary than this Great one's going point. to happen. Right. Great point. Jindal, we've forgotten about because he had one bad bad response to a State of the Union that, and he, I remember I was in Iowa a couple of months ago and I was amazed, every, every activist I talked to at Republican events had met him already because as he just keeps finding ways to show up at Republican breakfast and, and in, the, in these swing states, he doesn't, he, he hasn't excite people for the, the, in, in ways that Christie doesn't. He, he, like Christie, actually is, go, is going to go into this with a lot of problems at home and low poll numbers and a couple of big failures in the issues yep. he right. cared about. But you can tell the different story in Iowa and New Hampshire. So I don't, I don't think it's a weak field at all. It's a much... It's I, a I mean, very unsettled field is what yeah. it is. You're it's starting at, It's wide open. Yeah, yeah, unlike 2012, open, 2012 Mitt Romney was... Oh, there, were, there were actually two sets in the field. There was this, this big name side, right? And Romney was on there. Um, but then you had all the, the sort of the stop Romney movement on the establishment yeah. side, which was Mitch Daniels, Haley Barber, all these other people. You go down the road. They all Christy. decided not to, Christy, they all decided Very not to run. Non materialized. Right? All yeah. decided not to run. Um, but you were basically going up against an incumbent president, which was still seen as a problem. And then you had sort of this field of a thousand conservative flowers who were lesser known. And now you have a very unsettled field. I mean, the only asterisk that I would put on what, what Christie is saying, and this was also in, in what Mike Allen wrote, and this, I think, is the bigger issue. A, I think it is, it's hard to overstate the degree to which Christie has been hobbled by the Bridgegate issue in terms of donors, in terms of expectations, in terms of ability to organize, and sort of the puncturing the aura of it's, bigness. It's delayed, that he had. at best, number it's delayed, one. Right? But yeah. number two, his state is having serious fiscal problems. Yes. And yeah. so at the end it of the day, that is going to be the heart. When, you are, when your whole <laughs> message is going to be, a New Jersey miracle, and you have had eight credit downgrades, and Atlantic City is right. imploding. Right. It's really the hard to sell that. Yeah. So it, it, I think, from a political talent perspective, it's an incredibly strong field. So, mm -hmm. so putting aside any ideologicals, I think I think Chris Christie, Ted, and and Rand Paul particularly are just massively gifted politicians. I mean, I, you if you uh, you know you go in a room with them, he was they are massively gifted politicians. 
Um, I, I think that the most interesting ideological battle, particularly in foreign policy, is the Chris Christie Rand Paul. I mean, I'm, I'm really looking forward to those those right. battles because I think there's 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 a lot to it. Um, I think that the thing I actually think the big question mark is Jeb Bush, because I I really think that Jeb Bush Hillary Clinton is the election America deserves. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> like, I, I <laughs> and I I think that would be the most bold words, Chris. <laughs> I think that would be the I, I think that would be the the, that would Hayes be, to America dropped exactly. it. Would be the, it would be the most <laughs> honest reflection of the totally sclerotic nature of the concentrations of American power to have Jeb Bush and Hillary Clinton. And I actually think if Jeb Bush runs, there is a good chance that he could be the nominee. You do. It is, despite having said earlier this year, illegal immigration is an act of love and getting walloped by the Dave makes, for the Dave rest makes of the this era. point all the time. Republican presidential nominees all the time say things that, that the base hates, that is going to be the and thing that doesn't get them. Yeah, and then they get the nomination. And they move also for anyway because they have gotten, more money and they get right. to the you know, like second wave of primaries and they, and they, and they overcome. Look at who's gotten the <laughs> nomination since Goldwater right. in 64. It was always somebody who was more of an establishment yeah. center. Right? Yes. And why is that? It's in part because you've got, it's like a bracket for the college basketball tournament. It's not just simply conservative versus establishment. It's always more complicated than that. And well, so that helps the establishment candidate because what happens is the conservative side is fractured, which helps the establishment candidate who yeah. always financially is in better shape. And also because there's this myth about the Republican base. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of semi-conservative voters out there who are not hardcore right-wingers, right, and they right. will vote in this primary. Who during the yeah, Obama except era, except a lot the of them have become Republicans or independents during the Obama era right. in, in the states that are going to have these key primaries. Sorry, no, 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 but Chris, to, to an asterisk to what Jonathan said, and he's totally right, except that uh, Jeb Bush and Chris Christie would cannibalize from each other. So Presumably, each, yes. donors so, and voters, Yes, right? number one and number two. And Rubio. And, and, and Rubio. Yeah. But also, in terms of Jeb Bush, his, the problem is not going to be, and Dave is absolutely right, uh, people say things all the time and it doesn't end up hindering their ability to get nominated. His problem is, Jeb Bush's problem is going to be that he has not been an active he politician yes, yeah. right. in, right. in yep. eight years. And he has, not won, yeah. he has not run a race in yep. 12 years. That's yep. a very long time. Politics have totally changed. Yep. Yeah, the yep. The yep. A theory down here, because I'm going to turn the conversation to Cruz and Perry before we get into Secretary Clinton. A, a theory about Cruz is this, legitimate or not. Republicans nominated fake conservatives each of the last two election cycles. How did that work out? Not well. Right. Right. If Hillary Clinton's going to be the nominee, and it's going to be an uphill battle anyway, do a Doug Flutie campaign. Put the ball <laughs> in the end zone. Why not nominate Ted Cruz? You can hardly do worse. Even if yeah. it's a difficult, yeah. right? Yeah. Even if it's difficult, even if it's difficult no. to put him in the context of no. a 50 state election, no. is the country as conservative as he is? Right. Why, why would the Republicans nominate somebody who has performed as poorly as Romney or McCain again? Give Cruz the opportunity to make the case. Yeah. Well, yeah, Ted Cruz. Um, <laughs> you know. It, it, <laughs> you know, I mean, they, they make this argument every single time, right? You saw that from Santorum. Uh, why, why should we go in pastels? We should be bold, and, you know, that's yeah. the only way uh, we can really win. Some of the folks I talked to have said, you know, they, and these are sort of establishment moderate folks in the Republican Party, say, sure, maybe they should put somebody up like Ted Cruz yeah. or somebody very uh, conservative, uh, and, and it would be Goldwater all over again, right? That he'd, he'd do so poorly uh, that it would essentially kill off of that wing of the Republican Party and kill off that argument uh, for, for good. Uh, I mean, I think Cruz's problem is that he seems to be sort of fading away in some ways. Um, he's certainly not well liked in Washington, even in some of these circles, uh, you know, in Iowa and, and even uh, in some of the conservative circles. His, his the sort of tolerance for him uh, among these folks seems to be waning, and they might have someone else that they like better, whether it be Rand Paul. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's an argument they make every time. It just never really. Anybody, works. Anybody, anybody yeah. see the possibility that Cruz might rise to the top here and and, and be the nominee? I think yes. so. But just what does conservative mean? Yes. What does conservative mean in a time as Chris says? of just stagnant wages because Republicans are probably are going to do very well this year with no coherent economic plan. I remember I remember vividly them uh, the house leadership at least saying months ago that would have an Obamacare alternative. No, they're going to win without it. Um, who what are they going to promise people or even talk about uh, when it comes to lifting up the economy that they feel is sluggish. Right now it's all repealing Obamacare. The only person with any kind of I think outside outsider tax, uh, ideas on taxes, on making, starting a family more affordable, making home, home, per, home buying more affordable, is poor Rick Santorum. 
Actually, no, go oh, I Rust see. Alpha. Yeah, in Rust Alpha. No, some of the intellectual class. But uh, the argument he makes is not that a more conservative candidate could have, could have won when Ron Romney did not in 2012. It's that a, more, a candidate who actually understood the plight of, de of people in declining yeah. towns uh, and wanted to you know, create more energy jobs and wanted to lo end the marriage penalty and taxes, that kind of stuff. I feel like there, there, there may be, there's maybe not an opening for him. I mean, the poor guy, he would have been Ted Cruz if he was from a red state. He just happened to be on the ballot in, 2000, in 2006. But go back and read the profiles of him. He was the, right. uh, sure. the conservative idea yeah. guy until he lost. Yeah. I think there is an opening for that kind of argument. Any of these guys can make it. I, I think if they just say any conservative can win, that's not going to be the case. Because in, there was a, a fight over health care in the Democratic Party in 2007. We remember that as a very issue, issueless yes. election. And Obama won. He ended up adopting Hillary, Hillary's health care yeah, plan. Yeah, I think yeah. there, there is an opening for somebody to do something interesting to a Republican base on taxes because it's, it's going to be four years since Herman Cain and, and 999, which was a ridiculous regressive tax plan. But I think showed when I talked to these people that they had some just grievous problems with, with their economic situation. They wanted someone to talk right. about it. I think there's an opening for that well, beyond just the label of what conservative means. The other, I would say the other thing, mm -hmm. the other problem Cruz faces, and I can imagine him being the nominee, although if you forced me to bet $1,000, I don't think that would be the bet I make. But um, the, 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 that Rand Paul is there too. I mean, that's the problem. Yeah. Is that they, they, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they, they're, there's a space there that's going to be very much torn, and Rand Paul has an infrastructure that Ted Cruz doesn't. So you may end that up comes from one, a guy named Ron Paul. Yeah. Right. That, that is powerful, real on the There's ground. A, an, an army in place. Remains incredibly powerful. And I actually think Rand Paul is a, is a like I said, he's a massively talented po politician. Massively talented politician. I, I actually, I think he is possibly the most interesting politician in America right now, and yeah. I think he has threaded a whole bunch of needles in a really interesting way. Let, let me ask you about Governor Perry. He'll be out here in a while. I'll be sure to tell him what you say. <laughs> Uh, as you know, he really cares what you East Coast media types think of him. Um, but I really am curious to know whether you think, Governor Perry, is this just a plausible, is this a plausible rebranding, a plausible pivot back to relevance at the national level for him or not? Beyond the glasses. I Beyond mean, the, the, the glasses. number, the number of... <laughs> you stole my look. The number of, uh, <laughs> the number of people, um, uh, of operatives who, who I think are pretty smart in the Republican Party and who are not looking to work for Governor Perry, uh, who believe that he has, uh, can go a while, is, is large. I mean, he, he is, he, it, in terms of the border crisis, that gave him a real opportunity to tap into something. Um, but I also think that he is going to, and I think that he will essentially, if he runs, he will uproot his life and move to Iowa. It is obviously very complicated by uh, a couple of things, the, the indictment, for one. Um, the fact that you saw in a recent uh, poll, I forget whose poll, but Perry's was at like 5% of Iowa caucus goers. This guy ran before. So that's not a great right, place to start out, yeah. number one. And not that he has a name ID problem. That's right. He does not have a name ID problem. He's got, I mean, the, the, his, his campaign last time was epically bad. And what was yeah. supposed to make him great was not, not just sort of natural gifts as a politician, um, an ability uh, to sound compassionate on immigration, uh, an, an economic record that he was going to run on, he was, he was supposed to be able to raise a ton of money. He, he raised some tons of money, but he did not raise, as, A, as much as people thought he would, in part because he was prohibited because of SEC pay-to-play -pay rules, but in part because donors watched the campaign start to crater, so by the last quarter of the year it was a problem. The number of donors from whom I have heard I'm hoping he doesn't call me because I really don't want to give him money this right. time. Yeah. Is a lot, yeah. and, and and he's I think, not going to have that Texas yeah, foundation right. of donors anymore right. because he's not the governor of the state that's anymore. Exactly right. and you yeah. can't you can't forget um, the power of being a sitting governor when exactly. it comes to raising money from For anybody in your state. That's right. um, so that's going to be a challenge. Um, Look, you can't you can't sell him short. He no, is working his tail off, that. and he's getting a real hearing in a lot of these yep. early states from, right. from Republicans who are looking for for an option. And I think part I of the reason that. why this race is so muddled is we talk about Rand Paul and Ted Cruz um, and their possibility, and I think it's very strong. You're going to have so many other claims on the votes of conservatives. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And whether that's Rick Perry, whether that's Bobby Jindal, whether that's Scott Walker, and don't forget Mike Pence in Indiana, Mike Pence, yeah. Indiana uh, right. who might step forward here. Yep. Um, and 
By the way, Chris hasn't forgotten him, apparently. <laughs> Marco Rubio is not going to run as, you know, Nelson Rockefeller, yeah, the sequel. That's right. He's going to try and get conservative votes also. Right. Yeah. Right. So you're going to have a lot of folks <laughs> claiming, <laughs> claiming the votes of the right. And, and those people who are going to be claiming that um, are, are better talkers. They're better communicators. They're, be, they're better debaters. I mean, part of Rick Perry's problem, yeah. uh, it was all sorts of things, but it was really the oops moment. It was that he could not remember on a national stage uh, what, he, what his plans were. Um, and, and, you know, every time you watch it, 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 it's still as bad as the first time. It was the yeah, worst, the worst debate ever. moment yeah. ever. Exactly, yeah. In, yeah. I mean, right? That's not yeah. an overstatement. It's, it was it's, the it's, worst yeah. debate <laughs> moment yeah. in, re, in the last 20 years. So you, this you campaign think, was plummeting so, before so this, that. Yeah, yeah, already, that, yeah. Was, yeah, that just sell, that solidified. No, no, I know. I'm just saying, like, my question about Governor Perry is, until someone comes to me with a persuasive case, about why that was a fluke accident. Yeah. Like, I need to be persuaded. Right. That was, he was well, terrible. Yeah, but you yeah. know, he's already, in fair, no, but in fairness, he has already been much better in his interviews. Yeah. I mean, he was really, he started out, his first two appearances in, in 2012, and Jonathan, I know you remember this very well, he, he had that great thing where he sort of uh, upstaged Michelle Bachman um, yep. uh, at the Ames, in Iowa, uh, the, in Iowa at the well, Ames I mean, and then And then he went to New Hampshire right away, and he was really, really good. And I was at the New Hampshire event, he was terrific. And then after that, whatever happened in terms of the pain medicine or whatever right. it was, no. yeah. immediately began no, nose diving. And kind so he is already one, better than he was. One final broad point, and that is, I think that, that, that we have now tested and t concluded that, uh, that these late entrants into presidential campaigns yes. right. don't yes. work. Yes. Yes. West Clark, yes. 2004, right. Fred Thompson, Fred Thompson, Thompson. Yeah, yeah. Rick Perry, 2012. Yes. Yes. And we now come to the conclusion that these things are very difficult, and you've got to be organized yeah. and prepared and start early. And have a fire in your belly. We, I yeah, mean, yeah. yeah, and yeah. want this stuff yeah. back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Want it. Which sort of speaks to all of the sort of non hillarys who are waiting in the wings. What a good transition. There we go. Nice. The segue. Thank you very much. So, so. Do we even need to talk about this for more than 10 seconds? I mean, the fact is, as much as there is discussion of Elizabeth Warren or Howard Dean or Bernie Sanders or Martin O'Malley or some alternative, it really does seem, if, if we thought she was inevitable last time, which yeah. turned out not to be true, this time actually may be, if she runs, she gets it, right? She's nominated. Yeah, and you know, one of the ways people talk about it is, you know, sort of, that there's no democratic bench, right? That the people we talk about, Martin O'Malley, Bernie Sanders, who I guess would run as an independent, uh, but really it's it's not that they're not good candidates out there. I mean, all of those folks we talk about, whether it's Elizabeth Warren uh, or, or any of these other folks, are as strong as the people on the Republican side, as strong as Marco Rubio, uh, but it is just that Hillary Clinton is really, really strong. She is scaring everyone away, at least so far. There, there's, there's, I think there's a couple, of, a couple of things at play. One, I mean, and I know we talked about this backstage, but so September 06 was when Obama spoke at the Harkin Steak Fry, and it became very clear that he was a, a huge rock star, but it was already clear that he was a huge rock star. It's just yeah. that people didn't think he was going to run in 08, and then he did. Um, it's hard to see who that is right now. There's nobody for, else sort of looming yeah. backstage. No, and there's right? nobody else. And, and Dave has written about this a bunch that, I mean, what made Obama impressive uh, and made him such a strong candidate was that he was able to win uh, a massive majority of African-American voters. But yeah. even that didn't happen until after he won the Iowa caucuses. I think right. that they were basically tied in the polls yep. until then. I'd so. also say, I think the Democratic base is chastened now in a way that I, I, I think is unique I to the era we live in where yeah. you can ha start a movement with hashtags. I know this is, I, I, you have to, uh, this is probably a cliche when you, but it's, tr it's true now that you, that you can have more political influence with, in, in going outside the system and forcing people to listen to you. The dreamers can say that. The dreamers can take credit for DACA more than any, 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 yes. or anyone who organized to elect Barack Obama. And when I talk to Democratic activists, and I'm sure that when people hear this, they just don't want a savior anymore because they tried it. They tried a savior who was going to change the country. Hillary Clinton yeah. mocked them yeah. for thinking right. that he was going to change the way Washington worked. She was right. And they're not, they're not weeping about it. They She's just think Nixon, it's know. better to elect a president and yes. have somebody who can appoint Supreme Court nominees and then force change from yes. outside, force change from the state legislatures. There's just much more sophistication about that and less hope that they can they can put someone on top. There's actually a lot of mockery of the Republican idea that the party needs to be saved by another Ronald Reagan. Yeah. I think Democrats are happy they don't yes. think that anymore. And right. by the way, that's, here's something that, that really hasn't been said, but in that way, Hillary is the, the most anti-Obama candidate in the field. Right. In terms of somebody, look, she, you know, this idea that we were going to nominate someone who was going to sort of clear the waters and right. um, was going to finally uh, sort of clean out Washington and, and, and bring in this new transformational era. Yeah. Um, she's sort of the opposite of that. She's a much more clear-eyed, pragmatic choice of, okay, 
uh, the country is really in a, in a tough spot. Yes. Let's get someone who's been on the national stage. Yes. Right. Yes. Uh, yes. I actually had somebody float to me that, that she is sort of Nixon 68 in some ways, right? Of like, been around for a long time. Oh no, I've been um, hearing this one yeah. a lot. You know, yeah. Yeah. This tough, case gets made frequently. tough, uh, very skeptical yeah. media. Um, yeah. uh, <laughs> but sort of let's go back to the status quo. Right. Yeah, no, exactly. The, di um, the difference, though, of course, is Pat Nixon was not perceived by some people to be a liability. I that's right. Ask you, that's right. I want to ask you. She about had cloth him. coats. I, right. Good I want to ask you about Bill Clinton in this. I, yeah. I watched the, the a little bit Sunday afternoon dozing, dozing off the steak fry. You know, Bill Clinton is still. This is a two for the price of one special. I mean, we've heard about this previously, but he will be a factor in this race. And I want to ask, good or bad? Well, Maggie and I were outside the. Uh, the Harkin Steak Fry Grill, op. where there, yeah. there is always a photo op when the candidates or when the guests come, when yeah. they're purportedly flipping the sirloins. And what <laughs> happens is they usually smile and wave and say they're happy to be there. Well, in this case, last weekend, the Clintons did a impromptu press availability. After ignoring the press for the first 10 minutes. I mean, it was, they, yes. they went back and then came, they went and, in and then came and back. And after Secretary Clinton had about enough of that, Bill Clinton decided that he wanted to sort of turn that moment into a tribute to Tom Harkin, right. put his arm around Tom Harkin and proceeded to talk up Tom Harkin's legacy. For 10 minutes. This won't shock you. The press there wasn't that interested in Tom Harkin's legacy <laughs> and proceeded to ask Bill Clinton about all manner of other topics. Bill Clinton did a 15-minute yeah. Q&A session yeah. Only with too us. happy to he oblige, right? Well, but yeah. this is, about this, yeah. topics wide and far. This, yeah. has been a, this has been a scene, I mean, I, I covered her, her 2000 Senate race and you would see this scene yeah. in various places where they would come out of a restaurant or they'd come out of a pastry shop or something, and she would, especially upstate, and she would get back in the SUV and he would hang around and answer all of our questions. And so I think that, look, I think that as long, he didn't say anything, he answered all manner of questions, but he didn't say anything right. that was problematic. Right. And so I think that what was, where it was an issue is just that you saw this contrast. There were two things. One was that there was one moment where they were standing side by side literally talking over each other to different reporters um, who were asking them questions just from different angles, but it was just a weird scene um, for, for one thing in terms of just the optics. But if, if he's not saying anything that's problematic, then at the end of the day, uh, it is going to be overwhelmingly a plus. I think that uh, he was pretty good about being careful while she was at state. He didn't do any of sort of the, 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 the legend of 2008 is that him going famously off script. When he goes famously off script, tends to be when he feels like his wife is being attacked. Well, he's a very popular so, figure. I mean, look yeah. at his approval he is, ratings. He is the most popular figure, I think, in the country at Anybody this point. Anybody think he's a, yeah. a liability or would be a, more of a liability? He could be. The one thing I would he say is that the, mo so. the, the modern campaign it, uh, is essentially a, a bizarre, has become this kind of video game in which you, like, avoid gaffes. Um, and, and it rewards discipline. Um, it really rewards Sad, discipline. Sadly for us. And 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 Barack Obama is it just crazy discipline, right? Oh, unbel yeah. like otherworldly levels of discipline. Right. Um I, I think it's actually one of his defining traits. It's actually like almost when you're in the presence of it, I feel like it's almost it, it does feel it's like alien. And yeah. I think yeah. that Bill Clinton is the opposite of that, obviously. Right. And I think it partly it depends on this weird the weird campaign media ecosystem in well, which like it's going to build on itself that it's a that he's a gaff machine and then yeah. uh, Bill Clinton gaff machine and that's like well, what did he say next right. and then this becomes a sort of spiraling thing I, I that that's a very like unstable set of chemicals but yeah, yeah I mean, and then we're going to take I questions think, yeah. so line up please we're going to take questions after that I mean I think one of the moments that was damaging uh, for <laughs> Hillary Clinton oh, was when Bill Clinton talked about Jesse Jackson uh, in yes. the aftermath of right. the South Carolina campaign. Yeah. So I think that's going to be an issue, a sort of the Clinton's record on yes. race and whether or not people like Al right. Sharpton are going to be all too happy to remind to, voters to, to, about To that, that point, just very quickly, yeah. if Hillary is the nominee, a lot of people think that Texas would be in play. Hillary is very popular in the Latino community in Texas. Mm -hmm. Hillary won the primary in 08. Uh, she goes back to Texas. She goes back all the way to 72 when she was co-chair of the McGovern campaign here. One theory is that if Bill Clinton was the first black president, Hillary Clinton is the first Hispanic president, and then Hillary Clinton's ties to the Latino community ultimately elevate her in places like Texas, where otherwise a Democrat might not be competitive. Do you buy that theory? I think that if she put Julian Castro on the ticket, yeah. she would yes. have uh, more of a claim on being uh, the... That. Is that not just three people in San Antonio talking? Do you think there's actually a conversation going oh, yes. on around yeah, the possibility yes. that he is the, he is yes. the vice presidential yes. nominee? Yes, yes, yeah. very much so.
The first oh, applause of yeah. the morning. Yeah. There you go. Uh, you know, That's yeah. what they All applaud. politics I mean, I is think, local. I mean, I think it'll be in the conversation. I think, you know, if you look at what Obama did, and he did this very purposefully, uh, he was the black guy running for president. He needed a backup who was white. Uh, and so for Hillary, <laughs> who's a woman, and that would be different, uh, I think it's our, it, it's a convincing argument that she might need, uh, you know, sort of the status quo backup. Younger, right. Younger, uh, yeah. white, right. sort of status quo guy. All right, sir. My name is Alex, and I'm a junior at the University of Texas at Austin. Yes. So in 2011, during the debt ceiling debates, The Onion noted that President Obama turns 50 despite Republican opposition. So um, most, most media personalities um, do refer to polarization, but they implicitly or explicitly state that Democrats have moved to the left and Republicans have moved to the right. right. However, on economic issues, the Democrats have actually moved to the right over the last 30 years, while the GOP has gone so far to the right that Ronald Reagan or Jesus Christ would not be able to secure the Republican nomination Alex, you're good at this, today. but what's your question? Yeah, my question. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's twofold. Has the two-party system propped up the GOP despite their increasingly insane policies? And why have so many journalists chosen to take an intellectually lazy route to false equivalency? Oh, oh okay. False he equivalence! Got, he, got it right he, got, he got it. Here, here's basically his question to you. Don't you suck? Yes. Yeah, 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 that's it. We, we caught it. We, we heard it. His question. Yeah, we heard it. Anybody want to take it? There is, let me say this. Uh, it is true. Chris will it, speak for all of us. Uh, yeah. <laughs> No, I, I feel like I can, I, I, I will, um, from someone who I don't think uh, generally is accused of engaging in false equivalency, um, it, it is true almost as a definitional matter, right, that the center is defined by the point between the ends, <laughs> right? And so it is also true that there is a degree to which, the, and I would, I would agree with you that the Republican Party has moved to the right, has continued to push to the right, particularly on economic issues, that that has moved the center, at least in the conversation. Now, it hasn't necessarily moved the center in polling. Um, if you poll people on economic issues, it, it looks about what it would look. Right, they right. support a higher minimum wage. Right. They do not want anyone coming for their Social Security or Medicare. Thank you very much. In fact, okay. John Boehner knows that better than anyone. Yes. Um, That's very uh, true. But the center of, of discussion is pulled in a direction by Ted Cruz. And in some ways, as someone who um, ha has politics that aren't in the center, I sort of tip my cap to their ability to move the conversation. I mean, yeah. I, you know, it is the case that the austerity conversation was created by the, the right edge pulling that conversation, the, the, the Budget Control Act, the shutdown, all that stuff, sequestration. They won on that because they were so far out there that the compromises were quite far to the right of where any Democrat wanted to be. And I think that's just partly just the dynamic of politics less than the media False equivalency. Sir, my name's Jordan. I grew up in St. Louis, and Chris, I want to say thank you for going to Ferguson and covering the story so brilliantly. Um, Question, please. And I was wondering, um, how much role do you think voter suppression will t come into play for both 2014 and 2016, yeah, and how much will you cover it? So vo voter ID, what some will say is voter suppression, those kinds of measures, how does that impact the 2016 race? I think the the backlash to it will motivate Dem yeah. Democrats again. I saw that a lot in 2012, yeah. and they're trying to get, have, make it happen again uh, this time. But I remember going to Florida churches in 2012 where the early, day, early voting days have been cut back. Sunday early voting had been cut back. Mm -hmm. And to the surprise, of, I, think, well, I think even um, polling averages said Florida was going to go for Romney. There was this higher than expected African-American vote there and yeah. in Ohio yeah. and in places where the legislature had done that. So to the extent they do it again, um, it's going to be a problem. In North Carolina, I think this is, that's the state to watch, I'd say, the short version. Watch North Carolina. If there's higher African American turnout there than you've seen in midterms, it's because there have been two years of activism against right. the Republican yeah, legislature right. pulling right. that back. And I think that is more potent than than the who gets it even taken off the rolls because usually yeah. it's it's like, I think like, that's right. Yeah, 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 that's right. So. That's There's right. not a lot of proof that the voter ID laws have actually suppressed the vote. If anything, like you said, yeah. I mean, in 2012 we saw African Americans show up high in Ohio. Ohio was I don't want to be yeah. a Pollyanna yeah. about it. And by the way, my prediction, that's been the uh, real fast, my prediction is if that does happen in Carolina this time and Kay Hagan survives in part because African American voters, yeah. you will see more Republicans come out and say publicly stop this. Stop it. Like Rand Paul has, frankly. Which Rand floated. My yeah. paper and then yeah. semi-walk yeah. semi yeah. back. That's right. Yeah. 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 Hi, 
Hi, um, so my name is Elizabeth and I am a senior in high school from Dallas. And uh, so my first question is, or I have a kind of a two-part question. So my first one is, if it's so predictable and inevitable that Hillary Clinton will be the Democratic nominee and ultimately president in 2016, does the Republican Party run a kind of laid down campaign, not put a lot of resources, not put a lot of money into it in 2016, and then run a winnable ticket with a Rand Paul, with a Marco Rubio no. No. in 2020? No. 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 no, no chance of no. Yeah. No. no, and I don't Next think any of us said that we think that Hillary Clinton's inevitable, frankly, in either case, but Win. certainly not for the general election. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, yeah. I think we just yeah. said she's the overwhelming favorite. So they for do the run a really hard campaign in 2016. It'll be a real campaign. It's going to be brutal. Yep. Okay. Even without voter suppression, among democracies, the U.S. voter participation rate is an embarrassment. And uh, carrots haven't worked to try and increase voter participation. Is it time to institute some type of penalty system to get people to vote? Mm. Isn't it Australia that penalizes? Yeah. You know Brazil, I, Brazil yes. uh, there, there's a number of countries that are mandatory voting. The two, the two biggest, I believe, are Brazil and Australia. Right. Um, it, I would say... Um, I don't have it. I sort of like the idea of mandatory voting in some weird way, but I also don't ever see it happening in the United States. Um, ma mandates are are uh, kind of verboten That's here. Right. We've That's had right. a big fight about a mandate. Right. Um, I also I also think there's a there's a question about why it's so low uh, to me, and a, a deep a deep structural, political, cultural conversation cultural. about why turnout is so low. I think actually part of it has to do with the lack of a parliamentary system. Um, in which, um, in a parliamentary system, A, you can vote for smaller parties that might be part yeah. of a coalition, so there's that, right. and, and B, you know, if David Cameron wins, David Cameron comes in and they get, they govern as Tories. They do their thing, and you know exactly who is doing it, and there's no filibuster, and there's none of this kind of diffusion of the American constitutional system, which attenuates con accountability between um, who's saying what and what policies you're getting. Yeah. And I think that's part of it. That's just like a sort of theory. Could I, could I, redistricting came up a couple times on this stage yesterday as one disincentive to vote here in Texas, at least, where the voter turnout is among the lowest and has yeah. been recently mm. the lowest in the country. Yeah. Do you believe that's a factor? I think that's a factor, but I also just would add the Scottish election that happened last week had, I think, 90% turnout or 90% yes. turnout. Go and look for videos of Scots waiting in line four hours to vote. For some reason, right? Scotland was able to have an election with ninety percent. They've turnout. managed to make it's that. It's much easier. I think yeah. that's the thing. If you, you need, if if there, if ever, if more states were like Minnesota, which has the highest rate from right. election to election, where it's incredibly easy, it's incredibly structured. There are tons of polling places in They're urban educated. areas and enough polling places in and well, high information but, state. Educated states. Well, it's a higher information, but then you can show up and register and prove. Right. I think if you make it yep. right. easier to vote, it doesn't need to Saturday. be mandatory. Well, there are barriers the, thrown up. The panel we had are not Bill Bradley and Huntsman and those guys. There was talk of same day registration. Yeah, yeah. Online, mm -hmm. online voting somehow. Saturday, vote on Saturday. Why do we won't vote on a work day? It's insane. Vote on mm -hmm. We're going to have time for two more. I'm sorry to say. I apologize to those of you in line. One, two. Could Cory Booker upset the Democrat nomination for a Hillary Clinton like Obama did in 2008? Could no. Cory, is Cory no. Booker no. the Obama of yeah. the cycle? No. 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 And yeah. It, no. I mean, this sounds terrible to say, but you know, I think a lot of these African American folks who might think about running to Paul Patrick, Cory Booker, sort of say, well, you know. They've, we've already had an African-American president, Time not necessarily terrible. likely that they would be able to. Yeah, what, what gets unspoken yeah. about is the fact that if you look at polls, um, uh, racism has increased yeah. in this country, yeah. and, mm -hmm. and that is a reality. It's, yeah, it's so. part of, sort of the Obama yeah, it, effect in a weird way. Yeah. Sir. Uh, insofar as the GOP is concerned, 2016 looks a lot like 2012 in the sense that it's going to be a very crowded field in the primary. And looking back on it, some of the biggest blows to Romney happened in the primary. You think vulture capitalism, Bain attacks by Gingrich, and even self-deportation. So the presumable nominee, the eventual nominee, can they emerge as electable? I, I think you, I don't know if there's a definitive yes or no question, but people shouldn't underestimate that moment that the Governor Perry Mitt Romney immigration dynamic, which was the thing that killed off Perry. The first yeah. thing, yes. you don't have yeah. a heart yeah. moment. And, the debate, the debate the Florida and you saw yeah. Mitt Romney right. just had this moment. You saw, you can watch it. I've watched this tape before because we've run the tape on the show. When he sees Perry say that, he's like, oh my God, you just <laughs> threw me a fastball right down the middle. Like, I am going to crush yeah. this. And he was so excited to do it because Romney was looking for opportunities yeah. to prove his conservative bona yes. fides. Yes. And it absolutely killed him in the general. 
That, that whole moment, the whole immigration policy was brutal for him in the general, and I think that that, that dynamic is a very dangerous one, it, particularly on this issue, on the, on the immigration issue. Yeah, the flip side of that, though, in terms of, in ter and, I, and I don't disagree with that at all in terms of the immigration issue and in terms of a few other issues, but the flip side is that if the Democrats do not have a real primary, if the Democrats do not actually engage each other, so the yeah, entire time yeah. you have Republicans who are going to be firing shots at each other, but also firing a ton of shots at Hillary Clinton, yeah. and she's gonna have sort yep. of nothing occupying herself and sharpening her own skills, there are a lot of Hillary Clinton supporters who worry about yeah. the last yes. one. Want, totally. want somebody and, in that yeah. race. And, yep. and I, so Idle I think that it's, that. Yeah. 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 you just don't know how any of this is going to um, play out. Let me get one final point. Yeah. Um, I was just struck by this at a meeting of the governors earlier this year. And these governors' conferences are always opportunities for the ambitious next generation to sort of show their stuff. And yep. yeah. the, the Democratic governors were all sort of crestfallen because they all knew that they were going to have to sort of wait their turn. Sit out a cycle. Mm -hmm. that takes four or two cycles. Or two. Right. And it, it occurred to me there um, that the parties have flipped roles. And the, the Democratic Party, as they've become more of a majority party in the country at the presidential level, as the Republicans were for 40 years, have become the much more calculating hierarchical party about mm -hmm. let's not screw this up. We got to win this right. thing. And so let's nominate the person who is safe, who's going to get us 270. And the Republicans have become mm -hmm. much more of the fractious Will Rogers insurgency yes. party um, who are you know, riven by sort of discord internally yes. and who are trying to find their way and figure out who they are yes. because they are increasingly at the presidential level a minority party. They need a defensive nominee in the way that Bill Clinton could play defense in the 1990s, and, and that's their challenge now. This, uh, what a great conversation. Could do this a lot longer if we had more time, but we are so fortunate to have had this much time. Please uh, thank Maggie, Chris, Nia, Jonathan, thank you. and Dave Weigel. Thank you all very much. We'll be back with Governor Perry in a little while. Thank you. Thanks. I was great.